welcome to the Ghosts of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 122 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 48 of A Clash of Kings, that's Danny 4. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter. We're going to try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we'll provide you some entertainment while we do it. We'll summarize what's happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They've got some digital information about the places and characters in this chapter. Be particularly handy if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing just fine. How about you? I'm uh, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I uh, I know you're busy. Uh, I'm being very busy with work, so we're we're recording late. It's been a arduous week, but I am up for this because this is always the best part of my week. All right. Mine as well. Hopefully our listener. Hopefully it ranks highly with our listeners as, yeah. as well. I have a I have a funny story for you. It's funny actually because I I wrote this note quite a few days ago and I'd forgotten this story, but now reading the note has just reminded me of it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good story. So um, my wife is a teacher's assistant in a pre kindergarten class. Right. Yeah. Teaches from so the bathroom the four- on occasion. Yes. So it's four year olds and they're a little bit unruly this particular crop of four-year-olds she puts it down to uh, covid she thinks that this is too you know from the age of two to four these kids were isolated and not uh mixing the way oh, normal sure. kids would their social so their social their, skills are, are off a little bit their socialization is lacking exactly and so she she they, they have some problems and one of them has a very strict parent who uh does not stand for the nonsense that the kid puts it does but the kid does the nonsense nonetheless and um he was playing with a car which he brought from home a little toy car uh-huh. and was told to put it away and didn't and eventually the teacher took it from him and put it in her pocket and before he left she reached back into her pocket and put it in his bag not even telling him she was returning it but just so it wasn't confiscated forever that evening like before she left the father dragged the child into the classroom and said, is this yours? And it was the chub for her car, the, the, the keyless fob oh, for her no. car. Oh, <laughs> no. And <laughs> so the father thought that the child had stolen it from the teacher <laughs> as a revenge attack for the theft of the car. The kid was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> but the teacher had accidentally, it was roughly the same size. She'd given her car key to the kid. <laughs> so she explained it to him and the dad apparently said, you have saved the child. <laughs> He, so, he thought I, his son was a car thief at the age of four. Exactly. <laughs> oh. I, I loved that story. I just loved the dad. I just loved the fact that he was just like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of you. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the poor kid. He was just an innocent uh, bystander in the exactly. whole thing. I mean, to be fair, he should have put the car away when told. Yes. That was the root cause of this problem. Exactly. If you take it all the way back, it is ultimately his fault. So, But... um. The dad didn't have any uh, reason to fear that the uh, teacher would have left before he got there because she wasn't going anywhere until she, <laughs> she got was going there. nowhere. <laughs> she, she's she's going to be holding a little car, pressing it, going, "What the heck?" <laughs> you wonder if she saw that car, if she would have realized. <gasps> yeah, <laughs> probably. The... <laughs> that <would> be... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man, that's good stuff. Well, I uh, I had a, a story for you as well. Uh, she's up to it again. Up to her old tricks. That's uh, that's Stacy Lannister. <laughs> you may recall about two about two years ago, around this time, I came home from a swim practice one day to to discover that the uh, well, not discover. I was told on the phone before I got here that um, the handle of the shower in our master bath had been oh, ripped off the wall, yeah. and the the door into the shower was off its hinges and laying inside the mm-hmm. the shower itself and ultimately that led to a, an entire redo of our master bath right. uh, so fast forward to a uh, late this past week 
And um, I'm down here working in the basement like I, I normally do. And I, I get a call upstairs and, and I come up into the kitchen and Stacy Lannister is holding the the um, kitchen faucet nozzle in her hands. Oh, yeah. But it's not attached. She's not holding it attached to the faucet. <laughs> no, which you, where it would normally be. Right. It was just in her hand. And I was like, what did you do? And she said, it was dripping. So I twisted it. I, I was twisting it to try to get it to stop dripping. And I ripped it off. And I was like, oh, you're going to try and parlay this into a new kitchen, aren't you? <laughs> 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 That's not happening. <laughs> uh, no, so I did have to put in a whole new faucet, which took way too long on my Saturday. But uh, I, I'm not putting in a whole new kitchen. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I, I think I've told you before. That's how my kitchen got refurbished. Was was it started with a dripping faucet? Uh, the tap dripped, and ten thousand dollars later, we had a new kitchen. <laughs> So she might, so I, I'm going to have to be diligent, but she's going to just start yeah, ripping things apart one at a time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Carson is no Cersei Lannister, you know, she's, uh, <laughs> Stacy is. <laughs> anyway, well, we uh, got a, quite the show today, so I guess we should get down to it, huh? I feel like you're stealing my line. Oh, yes, go on. You got, you got, okay. You've got to say what we got to do. Let's get down to business. How did we leave Daenerys Targaryen? Danny had been fated in Karth, but nobody seems willing to give her the 50,000 troops and 500 warships. The nerve of some people. I tell you. She's rebuffing Zaro Joan Duxus's marriage overtures, which feel rather rote, studiously ignoring the offers of heading to Ashai with Quaith, the Shadowbinder. She's even beginning to consider visiting the Warlocks in the House of the Undying to get their help. McKellie, why don't we give them the summary of this one? Well, that's exactly what she does. She does visit the warlocks in the House of the Undying. Uh, so Daenerys and Retinue arrive at the House of the Undying, which is the stronghold of the warlocks of Karth. She is not impressed, nor are her retinue. The Blood Riders and Jorah want her to not enter this evil palace, and Zarozo and Daxus definitely doesn't want her to go in, a phrase he'll lose his star attraction. Pyapri appears out of nowhere and tells Danny she must enter alone or not at all, and the wisdom of the Undying would be forevermore denied to her. Pri leads her to the door and tells her how to navigate the maze. Always go upstairs, always take the first door on the right. At the door, she's met by a strange small man who provides her with a blue drink that stains the lips of the warlocks. It's called Shade of the Evening. She's worried about getting stained, but Pri assures her that this will just open her senses to the experiences that await her. She drinks and goes in, accompanied only by Drogon. She follows the sorcerer's instructions. Always right, always up. Through some doors, she sees visions. Danny tries not to look, but the temptation is too much. She sees a sex act between a woman and more of the small men like the one who gave her the drink. The next room shows a slaughter at a feast. The bodies are mutilated, and above the scene on a throne is a dead man with a wolf's head. He wore an iron crown and held a leg of lamb as a scepter. Next she sees the house in Bravos with the red door and the lemon tree, and her old protector Sir Willem Derry. She's tempted to go to him. But like the other visions, this door is on the left. Next, she sees the throne room of the Red Keep, as it was before Robert the Usurper, with dragon skulls on the walls. Atop the Iron Throne sits an old man who says, Let him be the king over charred bones and cooked meat. Let him be the king of ashes. Danny moves on. Next, she sees a young man she thinks for a second is Viserys, but this guy is taller with indigo eyes. He's talking to the mother of a newborn. Egan, what better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asks. He has a song. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. Oh, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. At this point, he looks at Danny and says, There must be one more. The dragon has three heads. Danny moves on and reaches the end of the enormous hallway without ever seeing a door on the right. Something sinister begins to close on her, but just before it reaches her, she decides that the last door on the left must be the first door on the right, so she goes through. 
She enters a chamber and can see Pri through an open door. He beckons her, but there is a door to her right, so she ignores him. He's not happy. She finally sees a room filled with glorious wizards who welcome her. They beckon her, but Drogon spots that the open door to their room is hiding a door further to the right. It's it's propped open, hiding the fact there's another door. Trickery. Uh, she goes through that door instead. Now she truly finds the Undying. They are wraith-like, sitting around a table above which hovers a giant putrid heart. She asks for their wisdom. They tell her she is the child of three and that the dragon has three heads. She must ride three mounts to bed, to dread, to love. She will know three treasons for blood, for gold, for love. And she must light three fires for life, for death, and to love. She sees more visions. Viserys in his death throes. A tall, copper-skinned lord before a burning city with the banner of a fiery stallion behind him. A prince saying a woman's name as he dies on his knees, the rubies spraying from his chest. A red sword in the hand of a blue-eyed king with no shadow. Crowds cheering a dragon banner. A stone beast rising from a smoking tower. Her silver beneath stars. A corpse at the prow of a ship. A blue flower growing from a wall of ice. A child running toward a house with a red door. A dragon bursting from Miri Mazdor's forehead as she burns. A naked man dragged behind a horse. A white lion. The Dosh Kaleen paying homage to Danny. Ten thousand slaves calling her mother. There will be a test on this. Uh, the <laughs> <end>. <laughs> well, the test is for us, really. There's a lot to go through there. <laughs> Uh, the slaves reach for her and she feels them sort of re reaching at her and tearing at her clothes but it's really the undying reaching for her and as she begins to be pulled down Drogon race, rains fire over them and tears at the rotting heart the undying dissipate as husks Drogon follows as she flees and she finds an exit Priapri Priap is apoplectic and tries to kill her but Drogon flies into his face and Danny's friends pin the sorcerer down while Jorah kneels beside her. Whew. I, 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 it was a very enjoyable chapter, but I don't like these... These chapters make for difficult episodes, I find. They because do. Because there's a lot of spoiler here that we have to tread very carefully around. Yep. And there's just too much to remember, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think of the 122 episodes we've done so far, this was probably the hardest to prepare an episode around this chapter because of the things like, you just mentioned I feel like bursting into tears at this point i have to say but <laughs> we, we, we'll soldier through that's right so the house uh, of the dying is particularly unimpressive on the outside it, it, it is it's yeah. um it sounded to me a bit like a rundown walmart yeah they, smaller not that big they describe it as gr like gray crumbling ruin like low and long with Single no story, towers and yeah, windows. Yeah. And uh, it, they, there were like ceiling tiles or like roof tiles missing. And the mortar was falling out of the the uh, the walls. So, yeah, in, in my head, I was thinking um, an old rundown Walmart, basically. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. But but it's like Doctor Who's TARDIS because it's different on the inside than it was on the outside. True, she, yes. She said it was very low, but she kept climbing stairs the whole time <laughs> yes. she was in there. So. Um, she she's forced to take shade of the evening before going into the house of the undying. I'm a little bit worried about that. I've got to say. I mean, so basically, you're going in there, and they're telling you you might never come out unless you obey our instructions. Here, drink this drink that you have no idea what it'll do to you, and then go follow our instructions to the letter. All your life is forfeit. It's like <laughs> right. you may never come back out again. <laughs> yeah, and also. Uh, the fact that she takes shade of the evening before going in makes you wonder how much of this did she actually experience and how much might have been hallucination. Right. right. So, uh, yeah. you know, she she goes into the door. She goes into the building after she takes the uh, shade of the evening. and She takes a few right turns and realizes she's in the presence of magic, 
But <laughs> I was thinking it would be pretty funny if it was really just four rooms and she kept going around the same four rooms over and over <laughs> again until the test was to see how long she'd do it before she gave up. <laughs> She... I like I like the idea that they sort of like they they're they're trying to dose the shade of the evening just right to get them to sort of like go for a long time. You know? <laughs> and she moves into the third day of going through these four rooms. They're like, I think we've overdone it, guys. <laughs> it was a tad too much of the uh, shade of the evening. <laughs> so, like Simon said uh, earlier, many of the topics in this chapter are spoilers. So we're going to talk from the perspective of the current place in the story. Some of the things we may know more of what they are than than we are letting on, but as we are, the point of this podcast is to be spoiler-free, so if someone can use yeah. it as a reading companion, we're going to talk about it as if we are where we are in the story. And And some of our speculation, of course, may prove to be accurate. That might be because that's a reasonable interpretation of right. what we're seeing which happens to coincide with the spoiler, could also be the way... I've forgotten. <laughs> so if Simon throws out a red herring, it might just be he's he's intentionally trying to lead you astray or he doesn't remember what happens here. <laughs> so the first room she sees is, is, is with this beautiful naked woman on the floor and these four little men sort of ravishing her. So I think, honestly, I think the shade of evening is just kicking in. <laughs> I don't think it means anything, this one. It's just like, all right, <laughs> that's a sign. You're that, ready for some vision you're, now. You're ready. Um, you know, <laughs> it's very uh, it's, it's, it's very ambiguous what, what this could be here. Yeah. I'd done some digging around on the internet to get some ideas of what it could be. And the most popular... <laughs> you, you've, been, you've been looking at pictures of four little men and a <laughs> naked <Right>. lady. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it had it actually has something to do with this chapter. <laughs> um, uh, the most popular opinion that I could find is that the woman represents Westeros, and the four okay. little men are the current four kings, claimants to the uh, well. I guess not all claimants to the Iron Throne, but the four kings we have out of the the five because Renly huh. is dead. How oh, very interesting. I, that, that, that's perfectly plausible. I re- genuinely hadn't have th- hadn't thought of that, but that is a perfectly reasonable explanation. Yeah, I thought and so. And also, it still works as a good kickoff for her visions as well, because that's the point. I mean, that's what she's... That is her story arc, basically. Right. Can yeah. she take the Iron Throne? Can she save Westeros from the infighting? You know? Right, yeah. So the next room she sees looks like a slaughter after a celebration. So the quote is that the savagely slaughtered feasters lay strewn across overturned chairs and hackled and hacked trestle tables, severed hands, clutched cups, roast fowl, bread. On the throne above sat a dead man with a wolf's head with an iron crown, whose eyes followed Danny with mute appeal. Yeah, this definitely sounds so, like a party gone awry. Yeah. So the wolf head and the iron crown both point to Starks, right? I mean, I think Rob's crown is iron and the wolf's head. So my first, my first thought when I read this was was that this was an allusion to Ned's very brief time on the Iron Throne. That was the first thing I thought of, right? Because his time on that throne really sort of precipitated a lot of the things that are happening now because of his telling. Uh, Beric Dondarrion to go arrest uh, the uh, the mountain, right. and also to summon Tyrion uh, Tywin to King's Landing, which all of that precipitated the slaughter that's now f- ensued. Right, and yeah, yeah. of course Ned is now dead. Yeah, yeah, that's all very that uh, all fits. That that uh, definitely makes sense. I I was thinking that it was maybe in reference to Rob's success in the Riverlands in the West. But in doing so, left his home exposed. And so uh, the party that they're having here with all the success in the the uh, West and the Riverlands is being destroyed by um, what's going on in the North with uh, the taking of Winterfell. Hmm. Now, we haven't uh, seen Rob in a while. Maybe he's up to something you know that might explain the vision. Right. We yeah, maybe. Because what you're saying there, I mean, that's a good interpretation, but but of course, 
it seems like a severe vision for that. I mean, I, we don't think Winterfell is very strongly taken. True. We think if Rob turned his hand to taking back Winterfell, he would do so in quite short order. And yes, for, right. This this imagery seems a lot worse than that. Yes. in many ways, that is true. But like you that say, we haven't seen Rob for a while, so maybe things are going south for him in other ways. Yeah, you know? he maybe he's he's up to something that will whatever whatever he's been up to, maybe it will lead to to something like this. But yeah. then there, he uh, he does appear to be beseeching her for help too. Right. Yes. You know the the part you're referring to is the. Uh, his eyes look to her for in mute appeal. So what are we supposed to take that to mean that, um, you know, that is she supposed to join cause with Rob? Yeah, like, it's yeah, that, it could be. But then what what had the Starks ever done for Daener- uh, Daenerys Targaryen? They helped to get her father off the throne and turn her into a beggar princess. Right. Now, you know, Ned did help. Ned did fight against her assassination attempt, but... True. uh, True. Aside from that, yes, I I don't know why she would be involved. And and why is she seeing this anyway? What's it got to do with her? Does she have a role in the cause? Perhaps it's a message to her. Perhaps it's like, this guy wants your help. You know, focusing back on the previous one, Westeros is being torn apart. He's the guy to help. Okay. Okay. I get it. Yeah. 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 So maybe it's it's not her that has a, a role in the cause. It's more her that has a role in preventing it or avenging it or something like that. Right. Right. Or Or, or perhaps it's like, you know, it's just saying, uh, I don't know, the vision The vision doesn't seem to suggest this to me, but it's maybe, if you were asking the lucky eight ball, who should I befriend when I move to Westeros, right. this might be like, the Starks are the ones to befriend. However, if, if the lucky eight ball was saying, befriend the Starks, I would hope that it would do it with imagery other than a slaughtered bunch of people right. and a and wolf's a... head dead guy on a throne. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> but we're, you know, but, maybe just it's just the shade of the evening getting started. Maybe it's still right. uh, fine tuning its message. The other thing I will say is, of course, is any other book I would say this could not possibly portend the fall of the House of Stark because the Starks are the main characters of the book. However, <laughs> this book, I, you trust nothing. I mean, this right. could literally portend the end of the House of Stark. Yes, that's a very solid point to make in this story. We we yeah. thought Ned was um, the main character of the story as well. and That didn't work out so well. Right. And, and, and literally, if, if the Starks were not the main characters of the book, that would be the obvious interpretation here. The House of Stark is going to fall, you know. Right. That's what you would assume. I'm just clinging on to the fact that that's not going to happen because, well, I'm going to stop reading if it does. <laughs> We're going to stop the show right now. <laughs> so next up, she sees the big house in Bravos with the red door and the lemon tree, which is always her sort of safe place. Um, she even uh, sees Sir Willem Derry, who seems like a sort of sweet old guy trying to lure her back home. Um, he, you know, she, you can see that there was real love there, like a sort of grandfatherly love for the two little kids. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can imagine for a long time when after the uh, after Sir Willem died and the the servants sold all their stuff off and they were basically just became the beggar, beggar uh, king and princess, you can imagine that for a long time she just dreamed of going back to that house and the security that it provided. It, we know in her her... Her flashbacks in her head, that's where she thinks of as home. That's where she thinks of as the safety and security that she's looking for. But there was, you know, so Pre said not to enter any room until she got to the audience chamber. And she sa- he said that, you know, the people in the rooms you pass might try and speak to you and you could speak to them or not speak to them, whichever you choose. But it seems, not it seems, some of them intentionally try to mislead her off the path right there there, there are trials and tests here i mean right. obviously this is an this is a fairly obvious test um that she 
the choice here is to keep going on this slightly arduous walk through the ancient Walmart or <laughs> go back to the place you've most wanted to go back, the place you've been happiest in your life, you know? Right. If they can lure her across that threshold, they get to keep her in some way. I don't I don't know what's the upside for the House of the Undying, but yeah, uh, clearly they're trying to get her to make a mistake. Yeah, I, I guess. Like, is it important enough to you to stay the course to get the to get the wisdom that we could pass on to you? It is important enough for you to stay to the course and temptation. not yeah. take the temptation. For, first, first of all, to resist temptation, and second of all, to see through the tricks and traps. Right. You know. Yeah. Test to basically see if she's worthy of sticking to the course as well as mentally tough and therefore worthy of an audience with the undying. But of course, I mean, we've already read the summary. When she gets there, they they give her some very Some obscure, more visions. Pro- yeah, some prophecies and visions. But it wasn't like she, she gained a great deal of uh, reward for <laughs> making it through this course here. And, and you'll find the 50,000 troops you see. Uh, nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> nowhere. We don't have them either. <laughs> Um, so next she sees uh, the Red Keep and the throne room. And uh, because it's got the dragon heads on the walls, we know that's pre-Robert Baratheon times. This is right. the Targaryens had the dragon's heads on the walls. There's an old man on the throne. And he's the one who says, let him be king of charred bones. Let him be the king of ashes. Uh, so I think it's clear, at least to me, from what we've read previously. I mean, this is just supposition because the guy did not wear a name badge, but this this is Danny's father. This is King Aerys, right? Because, right. in fact, I, I'm stealing this now because McKelly was telling me this just before this started. So I'll, I'll hand over to you. Why why do we think this is King Air, King Aerys? Well, it, it fits the description very well because we know when Tyrion was down in the uh, Guild of the Alchemists, Helene talked to him a lot about all of the wildfire that... King Ares was having distributed around King's Landing. So it fits that this guy on the throne is saying, let him be the king of charred bones and cooked meat. Let him be the king of ashes. It certainly fits the description of someone who is planning on creating quite the fire. Right. And and had the opportunity to. I mean, anyone could say that, but the only person we know of who had the means to do such a thing was Ares through the wildfire that he'd collected from the pyromancers. Right. We're not aware of any other instance where someone distributed that much wildfire around the city. Right. Could be something else, but wildfire is definitely a candidate for turning a city into charred bones and cooked meat <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and ashes. Um, it, it, could be that he's start thinking of starting a, a food truck or, or something. Possibly, possibly. <laughs> um, and of course, there's a connection to Danny because it is Danny's father, if that's the case. Right. Um, and, oh, the other thing I would say is, so not only did he have an opportunity to, to plan a conflagration of his, home, of his home, but he also kind of had motive, but two-part motive. One, he was supposedly mad. That would be a requirement, I would say. Right. <laughs> but secondly, he was also desperate. You know, the, the the Robert's Rebellion was going very badly against him at this time. Right. So uh, the temptation to burn it all down would have been there for him. Well said. Exactly. I, th- I think we've stated our case as to why this is, uh, why we believe this to be King Ares sufficiently. Yeah. So um, the, the, I, I wondered who he was talking to, because he said he was talking to a man, but he never mentioned who it was. So we heard from... Uh, Wisdom Helene that uh, well actually we know who uh, Ares's last Hand of the King was right that was um, Wisdom, Wisdom Rosart Wisdom Rosart yeah so, yeah so he's a candidate but we also know that the p- penultimate Hand of the King quit over the wildfire right is that right do we know he, that he, he quit he, he, he quit alright um, didn't go so well for him he was burned alive for not wanting to go on with this uh, wildfire plan. Okay. And that was uh, Carlton Chelstead, is that right? Yes, Carlton Chelstead. Chelstead, right. yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, the other people, it could have been a member of the King's Guard, I suppose, would have been around. Well, no, I don't know, that's right. We've, we've already had a head count for the King's Guard. Not many of them were around. 
one person we know who was around all the way to Ares's death was Jamie Lannister. He would true. He was right. He was, <laughs> he was the very last person to see him alive. <laughs> yes, he <it> was. <laughs> <laughs> You, you so, took that whole Kingslayer thing and uh, yeah, <laughs> it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> so it could be one of those people, but she never mentions what he's dressed like or what he looks like, so we don't know who who that person was. I was just curious if we did know. But then we get another, the, the very next room is a, another family member, it appears. She sees who she thinks is Viserys, but the man is taller than Viserys, and this man has indigo eyes not lilac like Viserys has and this man is with a woman nursing a newborn and he's he mentions the newborn's name is Aegon and being that he looks an awful lot like her older brother but taller and has a son named Aegon that fits uh Rhaegar Targaryen pretty well because you know, he is her brother, and he had a son called Egan. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. And also, she mentions uh, the the woman uh, nursing the baby mentions, uh, "Are you going to write a song for him?" And we, or we know that Rhaegar was um, a fairly talented musician. I believe that's oh. I believe that's fairly well known. I don't think that's a spoiler. Well, it is anyway. now. Now you've told everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can't put that so, back in the jar. But. So he makes a sort of like a, a startling sort of like revelation about what Aegon is going to grow up to be. He's he's the prince that was promised. Is that what he says? And, and yeah. he he is his song already exists. It exists. It's the song of ice and fire. So that's interesting because that's kind of like grandiose. And uh, yes, this yes, it is. kid got beaten to death at the age of two. It's a it's a trait with these Targaryens. They get these grandiose prophecies about their sons and then doesn't come true. <laughs> so, Egan and now Rago. It's like, right. oh, the stallion that mounts the world, unless he doesn't make it out of the womb. <laughs> right, we have the prince that was promised, the stallion who mounts the who mount right. the world. <laughs> so, so when he said there must be a third, is this another over, over-hyped Targaryen <laughs> child, perhaps? It's a good point. Yeah, you know, I mean, that that is a... Being that he says... His song will be the song of ice and fire. That seems pretty important. Uh, I feel like we've heard that name before somewhere. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, th- I was thinking you meant Egan, but you meant the, the name of the book. Yes, yes, yes I take your point. Literally, so, the name of the book series. <laughs> so, what does he mean by there must be a third? Because right. I don't understand that. At yeah, all. He, the, so, I get that the dragon has three heads, but but I don't know what the other two heads are, and I don't know what the third one they're talking about is. Yeah, so I guess it depends on who. When he says that, he's Danny says. He was looking at her, but he didn't know, she didn't know if he was speaking to Danny, like he saw Danny, or if he was speaking to his, uh, to the woman that was uh, nursing the, the child, who we'd assume would be Elia Martell. Elia Martell. She is the mother of uh, Aegon Targaryen, who was the son of Rhaegar Targaryen. So, you know, our assumption would be that that's Elia, although she's never named. Um. So I, I guess it depends on who, first of all, who he's talking to. If he's talking to Elia, we know that Elia and Rhaegar had two kids at that point. And so maybe he was saying we need to have a third kid. We've got, we've who, got to who, have one more. Who was the older child of theirs? Was was Egan the older? No, Egon was the younger. Rhaenys. Rhaenys, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so... That's a nice way to welcome the kid into the world. Oh, we're going to need another. <laughs> <laughs> this one's not going to cut it. 
Um, <laughs> That's the but, middle but child maybe, for you. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> maybe if he's if he's looking at Danny, maybe he's like, "Isn't there another one?" Meaning Viserys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if he's talking to Danny, she has three dragons. So because he says the dragon, the, we need there needs to be a third. Did you say because the dragon has three heads? Did you already mention that? Yes, so, I mentioned okay. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She already has three dragons, which would be three dragon heads. So that right, makes it a right. little more complicated because, right. as far as we know, Danny's the last of the Targaryens. So, uh, you know, maybe he yeah. means you need to have three kids. <laughs> and and Miri Mazdor has prophesized. I mean, but we see what where prophecies will get you in this book. Right. That Danny will not have any more children. Right. Yes. So there does seem to be a missing. I mean, if if the last dragon was Rhaegar and then the next last dragon was Daenerys, can there be a third dragon? It feels like we're we're out of options at this point. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Now the uh, so uh, as we mentioned, he uh, Rhaegar refers to Aegon as the prince that was promised. Now that that's the first reference we've gotten to that title in the book so far. And we'll just, we'll let the story reveal more details on the prince that was promised. But one thing I will say is that Melisandre sometimes uses the prince that was promised interchangeably with Azor Ahai. So, oh, interesting. Well, huh. huh. I wondered, I mean, we're, we're assuming this is Rhaegar and Elia, and he says his uh, Aegon's song will be the Song of Ice and Fire, but there's not a great deal of ice in the marriage between the Targaryens and the Martells. Yeah, so, so it's fire and more heat. <laughs> fire and sand? I mean, right. It's yeah. a lot of sand endured, I think. But I was thinking possibly Aegon would be the fire and he must defeat the others right. being the ice. But but again, Aegon died, right, in the Sack of King's Landing. Right. The mountain killed him. Yes. I'm not misremembering this. this no, you happen. are correct. Yes. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Just checking. You know me. Don't believe anything. <laughs> okay, so then moving on from that sort of slightly strange one, we um, we see Pre outside, and he he acts like, oh, you're already through? Fantastic, come along. But he's not the rightmost door, so he's yet another... This this is a trick, obviously, and right. uh, she doesn't bite. And also, he gets really hopping mad about it. I mean, like he was really adamant that she come through that door, and she's like... Uh, no, you told me to go right, so... Yeah, and he even says the undying won't wait forever, and she throws back in his face before he went in, he, sa- um, sh- he said to her, before she went into the house, he said to her, be patient with the undying ones. Our <laughs> lives are but a moth's, a flap of a moth's wing. And so she throws that back in his face when he says, they're not going to wait forever. So... <laughs> But she does eventually. So, she goes up these long stairs and she keeps thinking, but there weren't any towers in this building. So why am I walking up so many stairs? Uh, and she eventually does arrive at a great hall and she sees a bunch of wizards in fancy dress and huge windows of light. And another thing that was mentioned about the House of the Undying is that there's no windows and beautiful music playing. And your first thought is, it doesn't sound much like the undying ones that Zarazo and Dax has portrayed. He, he, uh, but has he ever been invited in? Let's be honest. That's true. He might not have any idea. He just sees the outside of that building and makes assumptions. <laughs> exactly. I'm not shopping at Walmart. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and they tell her that they've been waiting a thousand years for her and that they were the ones that sent the comet to show her the way to, to find them. Which is a rather use, useful statement if you're trying to convince her that she is meant to be here, that this is her destiny. Well, the only thing I would say to that is, did the comet point at this house <laughs> in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> well, but there's it was, a comet in the sky. I'll give was, you that. Yes, it was in the southeast sky, and that's why she went ultimately uh, into the red I waste. Guess. So, um, I but guess. no, it didn't hover above the house. With an arrow pointing down. (laughs) Anything that happens during the time of a comet could be like, well, it was bound to. Portentious. (laughs) 
And she's been assuming the comment letter to Karth for some reason. That's why she, one of the reasons why she keeps hanging out here is there's right. some reason the comment led me here. So validating that belief and explaining that it was them who sent it to guide her would definitely um, garner some uh, interest in what uh, yeah. what they and, can offer. And it appears to be the right most door, so she heads towards it, but Drogon is quicker on the uptake than she is, and he flies to the opened door and bites at it, and was drawing her attention, and she notices that if she peels back that door, there's another door hiding behind it, and that is more to the right than the door she was passing through. Right, but they, so of course, again, the undying ones try and distract her, they offer her the uh, knowledge of dragon speak, which is another right answer. If the question is things to say to Danny to win her trust and attention, yeah. because she's been wondering how to raise and train these dragons basically since they were born and she has no clue or guidance. Yeah. Of course they get the more desperate they sound, the more I'd be listening. I would be listening to what Drogon is trying to tell me even without dragon speak. <laughs> right. <laughs> because yeah, so yeah, you're right. Uh, so he flies up to this door and Danny uh, pauses instead of going in and she goes to the door and discovers the other door, the old splintered door behind it. And the wizards are trying to convince her to stay and the description is something like the wizards beckon her with voices sweeter than song. And it just remind it it just like reminds me of everything that Karth is. It's lovely and welcoming and desirable, but ultimately useless to her actual needs so far. Right, yeah. But 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 that doesn't actually mean that it's a bad place. I mean, like, I think I could run a very good city and not have 50,000 troops and 500 warships on hand to lend to the first person <laughs> That's who a good claims point. them. That's a good yeah. point. <laughs> But she does, so it you, you would be, I'm sure, be hard to reject this group because they're exactly what, kind of exactly what she's likely come to expect from the Carthine upper crust. They're very fancy dressed and they, uh, the, the man who talks to her, the description is that he is kingly and they're dressed uh, in wizard outfits and stuff. So you should probably think these are the people that are going to give me what I need. But she, she rejects them and she runs through the... Uh, the old splintered door. Yeah. And then she finds what, what is immediately, having played video games, I know immediately I found the right one here because right. it's nothing like the last one. It's, uh, you know, this putrid blue heart hovering over a table and these wraith-like uh, wizards around it right. who are uh, much more sinister and much more unpleasant. So they say that Danny is the is a child of three. So I find that one confusing because she is a third child, true. But how can you be the child of three? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yes, that is. It is confusing. I mean, You're right. She is the third child. Of... I'm not. I'm not criticizing polyamorous relationships. That's totally fine. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's an egg and a sperm, and that's right. two. You know? So yes, I mean. So, uh, again, I went digging a little bit into A Song of Ice and Fire online fandom. And some of the uh, some of the things I found is that some people think the pro that, that it's in reference to all the prophecies around her. Because there's threes everywhere in this. Okay, right, yeah. In this scene. So, so yeah, she's a child of the number three. You know, yes. Today's number on Sesame Street is three. Yeah. It would be. If if this chapter was an episode of Sesame Street, the number would certainly be three. Because basically everything they say is in threes coming up right. here. Um, I did wonder if it was perhaps Eris, Rayella, and the Storm. She is Stormborn. So. She is Stormborn. So there you are. That, that's, that's a possible threesome. Right. <laughs> um so then they uh, the the undying tell her that she must light three fires one for life one for death and one to love I mean notice so we're about to get three prophecies or three separate prophecies here and each one of them ends with to love to love yeah so yeah i mean i guess love is a powerful thing but i just found it noteworthy that uh, all of them have to love in it. But yeah, so one, uh, three fires you must light, one for life, one for death, one to love. 
So, I mean, the one for life seems like the Drogo, Miri Mazdor, Pyre birthing Which the dragons. Which brought the dragons to life, right. Right. Of course, it could also be for death because she killed Drogo and Miri Mazdor in that fire. So right. <laughs> that could be pulling but, double duty. <laughs> right, but it does say she has to light three fires, and that right. would be one fire. So <laughs> That's you... only one. But but Drogon is going to be a fire breathing dragon. I right. Mean, he is today, it turns out, a fire breathing dragon. So yes. he is going to light some fires to death, and he demonstrates it here. Yeah, and you know, could this be the death that the the fire for death they're referring to? It seems odd that they'd prophesize the 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 fact that they were about to be burnt to a crisp and not do right. anything to try and stop it. <laughs> but but maybe it's more, let's imagine that she gets her wish and gets back to uh, Westeros. She's going to light a fire there. A lot, yes. On her arrival. Seems not likely. necessarily literally dragon fire, but the fire mm. she's going to light by being there. True, yeah. And probably a lot of people will die in the process. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. And th- then the, the last one is... The the first two are one for life, one for death, and the last one is one to love. The fact that they switch it to to yeah. love, could, you know, could be a metaphor for romance, passion, fall in love again, possibly. Yes. I don't know how much we're supposed to read into the fact that this one is two and the other two are four. Right. So, so taking it very literally, she might be separated from her, whatever, whoever her true love is supposed to be by something that has to be burned down. Oh, So yes. that would be lighting a fire to get to love. If you see sure, I mean. yes. Right, yes. I like that. So, uh, um, then the next thing is she must ride three mounts. Three mounts must she ride. One to bed, one to dread, and one to love. Now, I think this one's more obvious, actually, personally. Yeah, think you the think it's Drogon one, is the one to bed, right? Obviously. <laughs> Drogo. Drogo, sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trying to make you look stupid, oh, aren't you? <laughs> one too many letters in that name. <laughs> I meant Drogo. <laughs> yes, so uh, Drogo uh, seems like because because of course, if you remember their early love making, as we all try not to. Um, <laughs> Yes, he, he the traditional Dothraki style was like a horse, so he would mount her in that way. Right. And yes. Yes. So, um, yes. Yeah. Right. And some people I've seen on the internet say that this is in reference to her silver. She loves her horse, and there's obviously a very strong connection from the very start. But I don't. I, I think Drogon. Drogo. I'll, I'll get it right one of these days. You're convinced think... that she's going to go to bed with this dragon, aren't you? <laughs> I think Drogo seems like the best option here. Yeah. Now, and then so that, to Dread, I mean, okay, I don't know if these dragons are going to get large enough where she can actually ride them, but that sounds like she's going to ride the dragons. I mean, Balerion was, the, the dragons of old were r- ridden by the Targaryens. Right. Balerion the Black yes. Dread. I get the feeling that this is a portent of her going to be able to ride those dragons and bring Dread wherever she goes. Yes. Very... I think that makes a great deal of sense. Like you said, Balerion was called the Black Dread, so uh you know, it it certainly fits. Yeah. Now it could be that she's forced into marriage that she hates him but is forced and or feels compelled to have sex with him, I guess. Yeah. But I think she's gonna um, ride those dragons like yeah, the Targaryens of old. The dragon certainly makes yeah. a lot more sense, I think. Yeah. But so, quite honestly, to love, your guess is as good as mine. It could be a, a future love interest, I guess. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe she's going to ride that dragon to burn down that wall to get to her true love. You know. Yes. Right. Now, I guess it depends on how literal you take two, because if you take the two to mean to travel from here to there, it could change the the mindset of. Uh, you know, like to bed, she rode the silver to the first time she and Drogo had sex after where they consummated their marriage. Yeah. She rode the silver to do that. To dread, 
could surely be riding a dragon into battle against yeah. the others or some major force. To love, maybe whatever transports her to Westeros, Westeros being her love. So it's, yeah. it's the thing. With, that's why I was saying this chapter is so hard to put into an episode because so much of it is just us throwing out possible ideas. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. So she, she'll also know three treasons, one for blood, one for gold, and one for love. For love this time. Yes. Yes, for love. One Did you for just blood. read the same thing that I was reading to see if I was reading it correctly? I was I was actually checking to see where we were on time. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, so I was screwed. slightly distracted <laughs> by that. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 122, part A. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, one for blood, one for gold, one for love. Okay, so uh. we're, we're running a little long on time, so let's let's go through this fairly quickly. I think the blood, I think we both agree on this. This is the treason was Mir- Miriam Mazdoors that cost right. her her son and and love. Right, yes. Killed, uh, you know, killed uh, Rago and put Drogo into a catatonic state uh, as retribution for the slaughter of the Lazarine. Yeah, and then the treason for gold is interesting because because I, the person I thought of was Jorah, and I know that we've done some research and that's shown that Jorah is the chief candidate here. But literally, his treason towards her, at least so far, was all about getting a pardon to come back to Westeros, right? Yes, which doesn't necessarily mean gold, but... No, but of course he was banished because of his love of gold, so it his, sort of goes to the... ex-wife's love of gold, anyway. Well, it's, technically, it's yes, things. not his, but <laughs> yes. Yes, I don't know that it's... I don't know that it needs to be taken quite as literal as gold, meaning like right. or gold yeah, bars. Yeah. Very well could mean for better financial opportunity or just right. better a better life. Yeah, but a treason for love, that's fascinating. What could a treason for love be? At the moment, I'm not sure we have a strong candidate. Yeah. But, of course, nobody loves her like Jorah loves her. So That's true. You know, we've would, seen Would Jorah... he commit treason against her to prove that love? Right. Well, we've seen him make odd suggestions, like keep going east. Like, he wants her to, to just keep running east. And we've suggested maybe he wants to keep her to himself. True. So maybe uh, yeah. in some manner he that's that he'll... that is slightly treacherous, and it is for love. Yeah, yeah, right. I can see that. Okay. Yeah, he he'll betray her. What's in the best interest for her because he loves her and he wants to be her one and only, basically. Yeah. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook, or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsherrenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. So she doesn't understand what all of this means, so she asks for help. They mock her and show her yet more images to confuse. So the first series is Viserys getting his crown of gold, and then a tall, copper-skinned, silver-gold-haired lord with a fiery stallion banner. Yeah. Help me out here, man. That's Rago. Oh, is it Rago again? Yeah, it's gotta be. I don't know who else it could be. I mean, copper-skinned, silver hair. He's got the copper skin of Drogo. He's got the silver-gold hair of her. He's got the fiery stallion banner. Oh, I see. I see. But then, then he never a, got to be that. So, so again, right. it's a, this is another of those what might have been prophecies. It's like, yes. well, that's not much use to me. Yeah. Well, so uh, both Piapri before she went into the house and the Undying Ones when she gets into this um, audience chamber here, they both tell her the same thing. He uh, Pri tells her before she goes in, you're going to see some things in these rooms. Some of them are uh, things that have happened in the past things that have happened in the future, things that may never happen. and So just that, anything, basically. You could yes, see absolutely, you, anything. absolutely anything you could see. And you don't know whether it's legitimate or not. <laughs> things that, so things that have happened, things that will happen, or things that won't happen. I think you've covered everything there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and then uh, the last thing she sees in this segment is rubies flying from a dying prince on his knees, 
who's murmuring, who murmured a woman's name as he died. And then they call her the daughter of death. You know, as we've said before, she's lost everyone. She's no everyone, all of her family, basically, including some that aren't like Sir Willem Derry. And, and so, this was clearly Rhaegar, right? I mean, we can say that. There's no yes. question that was Rhaegar. I mean, yeah, it was we know definitely he, Rhaegar. He, he had rubies on his breastplate that was destroyed by Robert's Warhammer. Yeah. That's the, why it's the called the, question for me. That's sorry? why that area is called the Ruby Ford the Ruby because Ford. of all the rubies. Um, the woman's name he he uh, he mutters as he dies. Well, the reason we don't hear him say Elia, and the reason it's not reported as Elia is because it probably wasn't Elia because he was really digging Lyanna Stark at that time, right? That's he what did kidnap her. Yes, yes and that that was that's what started this whole war in the first place. Right. Right. So yes, it's very possible that uh, could be Lyanna, not Elia. He gave Lyanna the. Uh, the- Flowers uh, at the flowers tourney and, of Harrenhal. Yeah, and uh, named her the Queen of Love and Beauty. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm calling her the Daughter of Death, I th- I think that's because of all the death that she's been associated with in her family. I mean, but but yet, as tragic as that is, each death has paved the path for her to be where she is now. Mm-hmm. If the series was still alive, she'd still be Princess. Daenerys. If Rhaegar was still alive, she'd still be Princess Daenerys. If Drogo was still alive, she would just be the Khaleesi. Khaleesi. Yeah. She wouldn't have her own Khaleesar. And you could even make the case that if Rhaegar had been born, she would be living for him to be the stallion that mounts the world. That would be her aim, not for her to be the Queen of Westeros. That's true. That's true. So the second series of images include a red sword raised in the hand of a blue-eyed king who casts no shadow. That sounds like the others to me. Um, no, could be, could be, or it could be uh, Stannis. He's got Lightbringer. He's got blue eyes, and we know he sent. He keeps sending his shadow off to do. Yes, it. his shadow. His shadow doesn't always stick by him. Oh, very good point. Yeah. Um, cloth dragons on poles with cheering crowds. Well, that's that's a good sign. Yes, right, right, right. Um, for, for PR purposes, you want the crowds to cheer when you walk through. <laughs> yes. And we've mentioned that we're hearing, especially in Aria chapters, we hear some support for the reemergence of the Targaryen uh, rule. So, you know, maybe uh, that's what that's in reference to. Yeah. And from a smoking tower, a stone beast took wing, breathing shadow fire. And then they call her Slayer of Lies. Okay. So I think I think a lot of this, I have some ideas on what some of these things are, but I think a lot of their, them are in the future, especially okay. of uh, where we are right now. So we won't get okay. much into that. But I think that, yeah, like, I, I think the first one might be Stannis with his blue eyes and red sword being Lightbringer and his lack of shadow. But you're right. I hadn't actually thought about the others. They have blue eyes. I I don't know where the red sword and the shadow fit in with them, but we don't know all that much about them yet. So, Yeah, I wondered. What I thought of was I thought of the comet when I heard the red sword. Oh, yes. The, the, the The comet might have been a harbinger of the others coming, and that the casting of no shadow might be because mm, they only come out at night. Sun. Yes, say goodbye to the <laughs> sun. Here come the others. You know, right? Yes. So it that kind of made sense to me, but but I like your interpretation better. I've got to say. Well, you know, I'm just I'm just conjecturing like you are. So we could yeah. one of us could be right, or we could both be wrong. So the third series of images has silver trotting through grass. Um, a a corpse stood on the prow of a ship. And a blue flower growing from a chink of a chink in the wall of ice, um, which filled the air she, with sweetness. The, yes, the flower gave off a sweet smell, and she's called at this point the Bride of Fire. Well, right, the Bride of Fire. She uh, she burned herself to death with the three dragon eggs and came out of that. Yeah. So the the silver trotting through the grass to the stream under the stars, I. Th- I, I've seen online, and it makes sense that this one is in re- in reference to her wedding night when they, when she and Drogo rode their horses to the stream under the stars is where they consummated their wedding. And 
that would fit with Bride of Fire. True, yeah. Um, you say, you, you, in the notes here, it says that the second one, the corpse on the front of the ship, is future. We won't discuss it. I'm very excited, but I have no idea what that's about. So <laughs> well, it's a major conjecture. <laughs> okay. But, um, I mean, yeah, uh, there's really nothing at the moment that, that we can speak to about that. And I don't even know if what I'm thinking it could be is true. But I will say this. Those of um, you who are interested in discussing spoiler type stuff about this, I I welcome you to come join the um, Discord community where we will oh, yeah. absolutely chat about we'll this kind of stuff. Spoil away, yeah. Yes, we have a whole spoiler channel there. Fill fill me in, we should say, not not spoil it, but fill me in on what I'm missing. Right. <laughs> um, but but you you reckon that the the blue flower growing from the chink in the wall of ice. Is is Rhaegar giving Lyanna the flowers at Harrenhal? Yes, that's my. Well, because there's a lot of blue flower imagery when, uh, like when Ned was dreaming of Lyanna, he was dreaming of the winter roses that were her favorites, and um, yes. you know he gave uh, Rhaegar gave her the. Uh, the ring of roses of blue roses at the tournament at Heron Hall. And of course she is, she's from the North, which is rather near the wall. Yeah. And she has a brother and a nephew of Ben, Benjamin and her nephew, John, who are both brothers of the night's watch. So maybe it, it more in general has something to do with the Starks again. Right. Right. Yeah. No, interesting. Yeah. So the fourth series of images, let's get through these. The shadows whirled and danced inside the tent. A little girl ran barefoot towards the house with the red door. Miriam door shrieked in flames as the dragon burst from her brow. Uh, behind silver, a bloody corpse of the naked man was dragged. The white lion running through the grass taller than a man. And beneath the mother of mountains, the naked crones crept from the great lake and knelt shivering before her, her heads bowed. So um, some of these, some of those feel like just not very important details. Like yeah. the, the, the the man being dragged behind the silver, the corpse being dragged behind the silver. That is certainly the uh, the wine, the, the merchant that tried to sell her the poisoned wine. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's something else, and are trying to trick us into assuming that that's what it yeah. is. But then, the white lion that um, ran through the grass taller than man—that's Hrakar, which Drogon killed. A uh, Drogon, there I go again. Which Drogo killed the day that the wine merchant tried to sell Danny the right. the poisoned wine. Yeah. So it, it it does feel like this is kind of like a sort of like a life flashing before your eyes kind of thing because she actually does. will remember a lot of these particular incidents. This is not sort of prophetic to her, apart from the uh, Dosh Kaleen seeming to pay her homage, right? Which certainly hasn't happened yet, and she doesn't seem to be on her way to Vias Dothrak, so it's not going to happen in the near future. It would seem so. That's an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, it, maybe it's another one of those, like, what might have been type things right, where right. had Drogo and Rhaegar the lived, that right. this had Rhaegar might have happened. the world, she might have been there as, like, the, the ultimate uh, Dosh Khaleesi. Khaleesi, yeah. Yeah. But again, so that, that wraps up all the prophetic stuff. If if you want to talk spoilers, the, our... Uh, Discord server loves talking spoilers. So uh, join the Discord community and, uh, you know, hop into the spoiler channel channel, and we'll talk about any of these things that you want to talk about. But unfortunately, we're constrained by our no spoiler rule in this yes. show. So um, one question before we depart. Do you think that Danny knew that Drogon was going to be ready for the fire breathing thing? I do not. You think that that came as a surprise to her that she that he was? Yes. Why did she take him then? Why did she take him in there with her? I was think it for his ability to sniff out a right door hiding behind an open door? <laughs> it was. That was the whole thing. <laughs> he, She's seen him go around finding right doors. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This is the dragon I'm taking with me. I found it kind of a little bit interesting that Drogon was allowed to come because Pyat Pri said she must go in alone or she can't go in at all. But then she goes in with a dragon on her shoulder. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe Pre was <laughs> eyesight's terrible. He's like, "That's a nice brooch you've got." 
<laughs> oh, maybe it's her emotional support dragon, and uh, they just <laughs> figure that uh, he can travel with her. Yeah, you know, I, I think it just it, it made it made for an interest. Like as far as Martin's thinking, it just made for an int- more interesting situation to have the dragon. Right. There. If yes, if we knew she had a fully grown fire breathing dragon on her shoulder, we would not have been very scared for her. Right. <laughs> There's no door. One second. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make one. <laughs> um, one. One thing, just to contrast with the TV show, the TV show, she calls on the dragons, all three of the dragons are in the scene for in the TV show, to right. light up, but we've never seen them do it before, And but she clearly believes it's going to happen in the TV show, so they, they definitely decided that she she thought they had it in them at this point. Okay. She didn't give any indication that she did. And, you know, that she thought that the, that could be a possibility today. Right. No, yes, yeah. Okay, do you, have, do you have some background for us? I do have a bit of background. So, like we were talking about earlier, uh, Danny sees an old man on the Iron Throne in, in the her fourth room that she comes across. And she doesn't seem to recognize him as her father. She's never met her father, so that's not entirely shocking. Um but also a reason she might not have assumed that it was her father is because she thinks that the man looks so old and she might not expect her father to look as old as this man did because when King Ares II died, he was only 39 years old. Now she's like 13, so maybe a 39-year-old man does look like an old man to her. That's that's another possible option. But uh, also late in his life, King Ares refused to bathe. He wouldn't let anyone cut his hair, trim his beard, or cut his fingernails. And uh, (laughs) Simon is using himself as a a model here. (laughs) It it can age you, I can tell you. (laughs) But because of all that, his hair grew to his waist and became matted, and his beard was tangled, and his fingernails were like foot-long yellow talons. So... um, and all of that was due to a fear of being touched, which stemmed from this growing paranoia that he had. Now, the root cause of that paranoia is actually a pretty good tale, but it's one that we'll let the story tell us about in due time. So I'm not going to, to bring up how that came about. But another reason that the Mad King looks so much older than his age is because he was thin and gaunt uh, since he was afraid of being poisoned. And so he didn't eat very much. And... He also had a propensity to cut himself on the blades of the Iron Throne, so his arms and legs were always covered with scabs and cuts, so much so that he became known as King Scab, probably not to his face. I'm just going to put that out there. But Ares' haggard appearance wasn't always an issue for him. In his uh, youth, he was thought to be handsome and charming, and he liked music and dancing and masked balls and young women. He really liked... The young women. He was a fan of attractive young women taking multiple mistresses. There's um actually a disputed thought that Ares had as many mistresses as Aegon the Unworthy, which would be quite a feat. Although, in 274 AC, Ares renounced all the women but his wife following the death of their newborn son. And then when a healthy Rhaegar was born the following year, it only increased Ares' obsessive behavior, as uh, well as started a fear for his son's life. So, Thanks. So, comparison with the television show. In the show, Daenerys never trusted Pyat Pri and never intended to have any truck with him. She only went to the House of the Undying because the Warlocks stole her dragons. I mentioned in the last Danny chapter that I didn't want to say what had happened because in the TV show, because it was a bit of a spoiler for what was to come. But yeah. that was it. Danny returned to Zaro's manse with Zaro to find the servants murdered and the dragons gone. Jorah doesn't want to go there, want her to go there, but she convinces him. When she gets there, she enters magically and Jorah and the Blood Riders cannot. They lose sight of her and she's inside and they're stuck outside. Okay. She receives no advice and the only two visions she had... God, it's much easier to get through the TV show, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> The Red Keep in ruins with snow falling on the Iron Throne. Okay. And 
Passing north of the wall, she finds a tent in which she finds Drogo and baby Rago. Oh. Both times she resists, resists the allure of the vision. She obviously, you can imagine she was tempted to stay with Rago and Drogo, but she also reaches out and almost grips the, the armrest of the Iron Throne. Okay. But both times she resists the vision when she hears her dragons crying for her. She finds the dragons chained up and Priap Priap Pri tells her that she is to remain and uh, chains suddenly appear and she's chained up as well. Uh, Priap Pri's argument is the dragons are strongest in her presence and the warlock's magic is rediscovered in the presence of the dragons. We heard that before, that the dragons are causing magic to be stronger. So right. the, the warlocks want them trapped so that they can uh, get the, reap the benefit. Sure. Uh, there are no one dying. That's just the name of the house. Um, it's just the warlocks. In fact, it's just Piat Pri. He's the only one we ever see. Um, but Piat Pri gets his comeuppance when the dragons torch him. When uh, D- uh, Denny says Dracaris, and the dragons fire up and set him on fire <laughs> and burn through the chains, and they uh, walk out. I remember that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. I don't have any pedantry. We don't have time. So news and notes, uh, just don't forget we're going. This is our last show of 2021. We'll be back on January 3rd. We're going to take a week off. I think uh, we, McKelly deserves a bit of a rest, but it's just just one week. <laughs> As do you, one, of course. Just one week, I promise. That's right. Um, we so I <laughs> I couldn't get Apple Podcasts to uh, let me see reviews. It was for some reason it just wouldn't go to review. So I couldn't pull a review off of there, but. There was a really cool uh, review from our, or not review, just a message from our Buy Me a Coffee site from uh, uh, one of our um, newest uh, monthly sustainers by the name of Magnus Ulf. And uh, the message goes, great show. I really love it. And I'm happy to support it so it can continue. The hosts have great chemistry, although because I'm not the best at recognizing voices, so I'm not always sure who is Simon and who is McKelly. <laughs> well, thank you, Magnus. That is that is really very kind of you, and we really appreciate the support. I yes, I am fascinated that he struggles to hear our voices apart because I, I'm I'm going to guess that English is not first language here, so that makes it much more difficult. But we have very different accents. I I feel. I, I I would agree with that. Yes. Sufficiently strongly different to be quite noticeable. But I, but I mean I, I mean I say that, but I'm learning French, and I couldn't tell the difference between French and French Canadian. You know. Right. Sure. Yeah. So you know, but they're they're very very different. So that that's fascinating. That, that is a good point to bring up. Yeah. Yeah. Ma- if you don't, Magnus, let me let me tell you. Typically. I'm the one making the witty comments and McKelly is the one laughing. That's how it works. Just generally. See? Right there. That's how that that's that's our roles. <laughs> well, thank you, Magnus. Thank you so much for the the kind message. And of course, thank you so much for uh becoming a monthly sustainer. It's amazing. Yeah. We're we're really appreciative of the sustainers. So thank you all. Conclusion. Uh Danny is exactly where she was at the start of the chapter, basically, but she did give it the old try. She she went into the uh, crumbling Walmart to see if there was anything worth pillaging, and the answer was no. Yeah, she got some prophecies, but what does she do with those prophecies? Yeah. I mean, like you yeah. always say, uh, that they affect you going forward, and you have a tendency to base your decisions off of the prophecies you've, you've gotten. Do I say that? You do say that, yes. I do say that. I was, you know what? Funnily enough, I was going to say that. <laughs> it's because you do say it all the time. I do say it. It's it's the Macbeth thing. I don't always say it's the Macbeth thing. Macbeth yeah. became king because he was prophesied to become king. He wouldn't have become king had he not received the prophecy. It affects yep. your actions from that point forward. Yep. But these are so cryptic and weird that I wouldn't know how to have my actions affected. <laughs> You just become paranoid of everything. <laughs> right. I'm not going to wear rubies and kneel down in a river, let me tell you. <laughs> Never riding that silver again, especially <laughs> through grass to a stream. <laughs> but but that was one of the happy ones. Oh, yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> one thing I would say for Danny is she best not to meddle with magic. I mean, I mean, every encounter she's had with magic recently has worked out very poorly for her. 
Ah, right. Yes, it, it has. And she was she mentioned at the very beginning of this chapter that she was drawn to the House of the Undying after seeing Miri Mazdor's abilities as a simple mage. Right, right. So she was expecting to really get some good stuff here and boy she must be disappointed. Yes. But but she has had some success. I mean I mean she she tried her own hand at blood magic, if you remember, when she dragged Miri Mazdur into the pyre with her and right. the eggs. And that yeah. did work. I it mean did. those those eggs came to life um but and and also of course this will be difficult for her if she, if she is to eschew magic but she happens to be the possessor of the things that are creating magic in the world magic is going to follow her around good point yes very good point speaking of those uh things that are increasing magic the dragons are surely getting more useful right yes just eating frazzled meat is one thing, but if you can actually set things on fire on demand, you're <laughs> you are now a little baby flamethrower. Now the question is the on demand, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, is Drogon yeah. ahead of the curve, or are all three going to be running around burning stuff all around Zorozo and Dax's palace? <laughs> Drogon is the lassie of the three; knows what's oh, yeah. required. I guess. <laughs> But she could, she still doesn't know dragon speak. The uh, the undying one certainly didn't help her in that department. So, you know, now she's she's got even more need to learn how to control these dragons, or they're only going to become more unruly. Yeah. So the future's still cloudy, but I mean, obviously, you know, she's better than she was when she was in the red wastes. You know, but ah, uh, yes, uh, yes. She is not getting anything useful out of Karth, so maybe it's time to move on. Yeah. Where next there... for Danny? I mean, this seemed like her last stone to turn over here. In That's Karth. what it feels like to me. She's she's going to go somewhere else after this. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll find out. Um, as always, you can reach us at ghosts.harrenhall at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harren Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And for spoiler discussions, Discord. But also That's non-spoiler right. discussions too. Yes, all kinds and, of and cool. What I found stuff. out this week is if you do mention a spoiler in the main channel, our our what do you call them? Our Queen B. I call her Queen Jenny B. Oldstones. She's our Queen <laughs> we'll, B of the Discord. We'll put server. a spoiler. Blo- we'll block it out so people can't read it. I was like, "That's fantastic." Yes, she she does a great job there. Um, but yeah, you can also you can um, buy our merch, of course, at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com and you can buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at uh, buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. You can make a single contribution or you can join us as a monthly sustainer. Either way, we'll be very grateful and uh, very much appreciated. But you could also go out and leave us a uh, a five-star rate and a glowing review if you want to help out the show. Nothing spreads the word more than that, and uh, we certainly would appreciate it. And if you do go out and leave us a, a glowing review, we just might read it on a future episode. We certainly would. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.